Okay, the book of John today, here in the Bears Gym. Chapter 17. And beyond, I hope, today. We'll see how things go. So John, chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. It was also wonderful when sons and daughters honor their parents by righteousness and deeds and excelling. We're all very you know, proud of them, right? Whether they're a mommy at home doing a good job with their kids, we're proud of them, or out being career people, career men and women. We're, we're proud of them when they do things that are excelsior, right? As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You want to know what eternal life is? There you have it right there. That thy, they, thee, I, you, them may know the only one true God, Yahweh, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That, my friend, is eternal life. That's a life verse here. That's, that's something to get tattooed or chiseled or painted on your walls or you know, made on a, to a jewelry necklace. That is a momentous scripture. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth, and I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father God is a spirit. He sits on a throne. He is spirit form. The Son is the epitome of God the Father in bodily form. The Holy Spirit is the working power of God in seven branches, seven fingers, seven, seven layers, some seven flames. When we get to various parts of the scripture and it talks about that in Revelation especially. Isaiah. The Holy Spirit has seven. He is seven. And yet God is one. We move on. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. To whatever extent, we don't really know to what extent, because we just don't know. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Yeshua, left something behind in glory, in the eternal realm. He emptied himself of something, glory, power, to some extent. But he also had that on earth, to also to an extent, but to put us in sympathy and empathy with himself, he lowered himself to the point of man where by faith and call upon, calling upon our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit to do works, he put us his self in our shoes to some extent. We don't know how, and he came through a virgin, through Mary, a good woman, but like us. We don't pray to her. We don't worship her. That's blasphemy. 
We pray to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, period. We come through one doorway. There is no back door through anything or anybody. There is one door, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we can only enter through that door. That's it. So don't try to come through saints or his mother or, you know, you know, rune stones or false religions or demons or spiritism. There's one door, and the door is Jesus Christ. You can only go through that door. As you go through that door, you walk a very narrow road through this life until you get to eternity. And walking with you and in, in embellishing God's works and desire to do good in your life is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is with you. He's been planted in us as we are born again into Christ as we enter through the door and get on the narrow road. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. To some extent. Jesus chose them as Jesus chooses people. Judas did not stay on the narrow road, did he? No, he did not. He lost his salvation. Okay. He betrayed the Son of Glory, the Son of God, the King of Kings. He betrayed him, his Savior. Judas lost his salvation. Can a person lose their salvation if they get off the narrow road? And when they blaspheme the Holy Spirit and they have no remorse, can they lose their salvation? Yes, they can. Judas is the ultimate example of can you lose your salvation? He had the gifts of the Spirit. He performed miracles. He did works. But him, like through the gospel, it says there was people and they were in sin, obviously, but they did great works. And they come before God and they said, didn't we do great miracles in your name? And the Lord will tell them, depart from me, you workers of sin. I don't know you. Everybody makes mistakes. If you fall, you get up. You confess your sins, you repent, you have contrition, you stay away from them, you stop the sin, you get back on the road, you blame only yourself, you ask the Lord forgiveness, and you move on on the narrow road in Christ. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou hast given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Our prayers go to those whom have known the Lord, who are struggling in Christ, who are abiding in Christ, but are going through tough times. We are pray for those that are in Christ that are moving on in the great journey of sharing the word and evangelism and, and being a good mom and being a good dad in their home and at their job. We pray for the brethren we pray for the lost because we want to see them saved. And that's a good prayer. I've prayed it, you know, I hate to exaggerate, thousands of times for those I love. But salvation is a choice. It's a personal choice you have to choose. 
God don't force you. God hasn't created you a, zomb a zombie, an android, or a robot. You are a free will, moral agent, human being. And you have to choose to love Jesus Christ of your own will and want to obey him and follow him. It comes right here. It's a choice. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. We're going to talk a little bit here about being one with God. And there's a perfect example that I'm going to give you here of taking the word of God to an extreme. There's a religion, a pseudo-religion of the world. It's called the New Age. It's called a lot of things. There's East Indian religions that are all conglomerized into a hodgepodge. Like I say, see here? You're one with God. Everything is God. You breathe God. God is God, and you are God, and you're one. No. God created the universe, and God is God. He created the ability of the universe to have, if you could pardon the expression, free will. Now, matter, atoms, rocks, can you say they have free will? They are created substances. But when you get to the point of a choice, where there's the spirit, where there's life, and that's where choice comes in. And that's why you have good angels, and you have bad angels, and those are called demons. They had the same rights given to each other, the same power. But when they rebelled against the Almighty, they lost that position and were cast out of heaven. Those are demons. They made their choice. We also can make a choice. The demons have no way of repentance and contrition and coming back to the Lord. They're, they're done. Their eternal doom is certain. And they want as many as you out there that refuse to love and obey Jesus Christ to join them in the lake of fire and outer darkness forevermore. They want guests to be with them. But see, you don't have to. You can choose Jesus Christ against the grain of society and plow forward on the narrow road of love in Jesus Christ, faith, obedience, repentance, and belief. Moving on. And one day, eternal life with our Heavenly Father. And all the saints that have done likewise as you have, that have pushed forward on that narrow, whoop, that narrow road of eternity. Get on it and don't get off. And if you've fallen off of it, get back on God just wants you to be honest. Say, yes, I was wrong. I did this and this. Get back on. He will forgive you. Admit your own fault. And get back on the road. Verse 12 of John 17. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition. Jesus lost him because Judas made his own choice. He wasn't clothed with the garments of righteousness. At some point in time, he made the choice to betray the Lord. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. 
I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You wonder why certain people out in the world, groups, kinships, clubs, pseudo-churches, church clubs, they don't really accept you. You love Jesus, you love his word, you want to be in fellowship and have Christian friends, but you're just not accepted, you're just kind of castigated. Jesus said, the world has hated them because they are not of the world. You're not of the world. You're not of clubs. You are of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times through life, you're going to find it's you and him. You and him. And guess what? That's the majority, and that's the best way to be. If you have a believing husband or wife, God bless you. That is a wonderful joy to be bound together in holy matrimony in Jesus Christ. Verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. See, God doesn't want to just bring them from a war toward and zone and throw them into, give them free stuff, and then spoil them rotten. God wants them to be witnesses. He wants us to be witnesses. He wants you to be a witness right where you're at, whether it's a war zone, a factory, construction, a farm, a restaurant, a mall, wherever it's at, to be a witness for Jesus Christ right where you're at. Yeah, people are going to hate you because you stand for something. That's okay. That's good. Because Jesus loves you for that. Jesus loves you for the things that the world hates you for. Isn't that, isn't that like a... It's like, wow, I can't understand that. But that's just a truth. That's a paradigm of truth. What Jesus will love you for the world will hate you for. So expect the hate and stay in the love of Jesus. Please him. Don't worry about the world. Please Jesus Christ. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When you hook up with organizations, they immediately want to start selling you books. And it's like, come on. You know, we need to be studying the Word of God. Don't load us down with all these books to be reading. You know, your your take on a situation or whatever. And that's okay for a small part. But how many books can you buy and read? I mean, most of us are working. And attention must be given to the Word of God. Period. Period. Okay? As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. That's why we're here. To be in the world. Belonging to Jesus Christ. Burning like a little candle right where you're at. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Sanctified in the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Several hundred years has gone by since the Passover dinner and the birth of Christ and the crucifixion and all of the apostles and the, the time machine of life has clicked on. And throughout all history, through the Dark Ages and the Renaissance and 
the Middle Ages and the, you know, the gunpowder wars and the world wars. There's been witnesses of Jesus Christ. And they've passed them on to the next generation. The teaching of the Bible. The words of Christ himself. So this is a truth. Thy word is truth. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me. The Father dwelt in the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the connecting force. It's the it's the mainframe empowering your faith. The choice you made is now empowered by the Holy Spirit to connect with our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou hast given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. You cannot understand that unless you are truly in love with Jesus Christ. Because if you find somebody in love with Jesus Christ out in your, at airports, stores, malls, at the job site, you will have no problem giving them a big bear hug and a shake of the hand and asking them, how are you doing? Hey, can we pray together? Hey, a little love, you know, just a handshake fellowship with them, koinonia, little gemutlichite in the Heiligen Geist. If you're a Christian, you understand that. If you're not, you can't understand that because you don't belong to him. When you belong to him and you run into another true believer in Christ, you connect. It just, you can't try, it just happens the love of Christ just begins to flow. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. See, it's a, it's a love circle. Father, you're in them. I'm in them. The Holy Spirit's in them. We're in God. God's in us. And it's just a love circle. And as long as you're on the narrow path, that love circle travels with you. When you get off the narrow path, you'll find that if you stay off the path too long, your little lampstand will be removed. And that if you wait too long, you'll find it's very hard to get back on the path because you've, you've dug a rabbit hole of sin and bad choices in your life. And now you've got to dig yourself up out of the rabbit hole. And God will empower you to do so. It's the best decision you'll ever make in your life is to get back up out of the rabbit hole of sin. But it's a job. It's a journey. And you'll have to cling that much more tighter to every little precept and principle. 
but it's a journey worthwhile for all of eternity. And if you have gotten off the narrow road, I implore you and encourage you, get on the narrow road right now, today, right this second, right this minute. Connect with Jesus Christ and get right back on that road. Now we move on to chapter 18 of John. We are now going to start taking bare steps towards the crucifixion. A very brutal time in history where the creator of the universe comes to a world that he gave to man to live and breathe and enjoy. And they seek to kill that creator. Why? Because he raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He fed multitudes. He washed the sins from people and gave them eternal life. And that's something worth being put to death for? In the world's eyes it is. So let's... Join Jesus. Proverbially, let's walk together with him through this process here as we begin chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where there was a garden in which he entered and his whole gaggle of disciples entered with him. They came as a little cluster, a bunch of little bear cubs with Daddy Bear. They don't really know what is about to be upon them. Jesus knows. He's kind of told them, he's kind of hinted to some of them exactly what's going to happen, but they can't really, really grasp it. Now the one disciple here that goes down in his history as losing his salvation He was possessed by a demon at the Passover dinner. Kind of interesting, huh? Going to church and getting demon-possessed, how can that happen? Because Judas knew the truth, but he made a choice to stay in his wicked sin. And because of that, Satan entered him right there in their little home church meeting as they were having the Passover meal. Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus was watching them. And Judas Iscariot was demon-possessed right there at the table. Because Judas made a choice and said, I don't care, I'm going to go on, I'm going to do this sin regardless of right or wrong, I'm doing this. That's what Judas said. That's like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because that's when Satan entered him. That's when the Holy Spirit was no longer in him and he was now possessed by a demon. You want to know where there's an excellent example in the scriptures of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? When Judas betrayed Jesus and was demon-possessed. Because Judas made the choice. A sincere Long, earned, thought-out process of I'm going to continue in this sin and wickedness despite knowing the truth. That is a great example of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place where Jesus was. For Jesus oftentimes resorted to their with his disciples. So they, they, they hung out there a lot. They had, they had singspiration time, Bible studies, prayer, probably had some meals there, 
time of meditation and rest. Maybe they took naps there. It was just a wonderful time of uh, getaway. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, he came with lanterns and torches and weapons and the temple centurions of that time. And they came to betray and take the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? That's an obligatory question, because obviously they're seeking somebody. And Jesus knows who they're seeking for. But he puts him on the spot and he makes him answer the question. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, Well, here I am. Come get it. I am he. That's what he said. Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Well, no doubt that's the power of the Holy Spirit knocking over evil men. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost not one. The Gospel of John doesn't really talk about the betrayal of Judas, kissing him on the cheek in really full detail. But if you put all the accounts together, of the betrayal, Judas and came and identified him with a kiss on the cheek. Now, as this process of betrayal is going on, there's about to be a little mini, a small problem with this, with it taking away of our Savior. There's going to be a little problem, a mini. Many problem. Simon Peter having a sword, they carried swords. They had to fight off the robbers and the, the, the prowlers and the predators and the perverts from murderers, from harassing them and taking their money and killing them and dragging them off. They had to, they had to defend themselves with swords. Everybody pretty much had to protect and defend themselves. And Jesus said unto Peter, because <laughs> Peter, many of you have heard the story, Simon Peter whips out his sword and he cuts off the high priest's servant. And his name was Malchus. They even give us his name, Malchus. So as Peter's whacking off his right ear, Jesus is right on top of it. Peter, put up your sword. It's not the time for that. The authorities and the governmental officials are now here. There's no more defending yourself from the robbers and the predators and the people that are prowling around your neighborhood and looking through your windows. There's, you don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to protect them, your household, your wife, your kids, as a, the cops now have this house surrounded and somebody's going to be taken in custody. So it's time to pull back now. Governmental authorities are here. Time to put down your sword and let them do their job because they've been given that task. That's a God-given institution and authority. And you can't fight the government. 
Okay, they're, they're, they're there for a purpose. Jesus said to him, put up your sword. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? In other words, this is what I came for, Peter. This is what I've, I've told you about it, but you didn't really hear it. But I'm telling you, now it begins. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Anna, Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. In other words, for whatever reason, he had some prophesying going on in his life, and he was told by the Spirit of some sort, we don't really know, that Jesus was going to die for the people, a person. And so they took it upon themselves to kill him. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And that disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. And we're assuming this is the disciple John, the apostle John. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? Remember, G Peter is the one that said, no, I don't care if everybody betrays you, I'm sticking with you, Lord. Now, John also got in, but she didn't, she didn't you know, uh, come up against him and say, Wait a minute, aren't you one of his disciples? John didn't say that. But Peter did. He went out on a limb and said, Oh, no, I will never betray you, Lord. So this little servant girl confronts him, says, wait a minute, you're one of his disciples. And what does Peter say? I am not. Strike one. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So Peter was just kind of trying to blend in with the world. Oh, yeah, we're all buddies. Let's just, you know, chit-chat and talk about nothing. The high priest then asked Jesus in his affiliation with our Heavenly Father, with his disciples, with his doctrine, with the Jews. The, the assault upon Jesus verbally now begins. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I taught in your synagogues and in your temple where the Jews resort. I have said nothing in secret. Why ask thou me of my doctrine and my teaching? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, I have shared the truth openly with all. Ask those around me. And when he had spoken thus, one of the officers which stood by hit Jesus saying, Answerest thou the high priests as such? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if I have spoken rightly, why dost thou hit me? Because I'm uncondemned. I'm here for questioning. Why are you hitting me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, they said, therefore, unto him, art not thou also one of his disciples? Here we go, second round. The apostle Peter denied it and said, no, not, no, nope, not his disciple. 
Nope. Strike two. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? And the apostle Peter says, Oh, nope, no, not me. Not me. Strike three. You're out. Ever wonder why you go to baseball, why there's three strikes and you're out? There you go, swing, better, 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 and the guy swings, misses, swings, misses, swings, misses. And the umpire says, whoop, you're out. Three strikes and you're out. Peter was three strikes and you're out. And then the rooster finished his morning crowing. Other gospels say he'd already crowed once, but now he's going to crow a second time and wrap up his morning crowing. Peter denied him three times. And the rooster crowed twice. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They were worried about keeping their little religious rituals. But here they're betraying to the death the master of the universe, the God of creation, the Son of God. Which kind of gives you the understanding that was the year they had the Passover. Jesus and Saples already had it. That was the time to have it. And they're about to have another one. See, there was like a double one, one for the Passover and one for their Sunday Sabbath meal. It was like a double, boom, boom. They're worried about defiling themselves so they could have their religious dinner, not whether or not they're crucifying an innocent man. Bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What occasion bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Art thou the king of the Jews? You're asking a wrong question there, Pilate. Why don't you ask, are you the king of the universe? And the answer would be yes. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? He doesn't know by now, and yet he's dragging him. He's allowed him to be drugged before them, beaten, whipped, abused. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants be fighting that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Oh, yeah. King of the entire creational universe of every living thing, Mr. Pilate. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, 
and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You ever wonder why you give somebody a New Testament or a Bible, you share truth with them, it just boom, goes right through them? Because they don't love Jesus Christ. They are not followers of him. They don't know him personally by repentance and faith. And therefore, these are just good words that they give and take on Christmas and Easter and when things are going down or at a funeral or when hard times are hitting or when there's a national tragedy, they, they whip out a prayer card or attend a church service. But when they hear the word of God, it just doesn't connect because their hearts hang on to sin. 